Okay, there we go. Um, let's see. All right, so we have some great speakers today. We've got a variety of people talking about a variety of ways they, they use or interact with biomanufacturing. Dr. Jen Chilupney will talk first about a kit that she and uh, collaborating high school teachers developed. Dr. James Hewlett will talk about biomanufacturing with mushrooms, so mushrooms as a model system. And Dr. Bruce Nash will talk about a new grant where they are working on cell-free systems for manufacturing phage. And if any of you were able to attend um, Genome Startup Day on Wednesday, you'll know that manufacturing phage is one of the biggest blockers in this new and emerging industry. Each talk will be about 15 minutes, and we'll have a question and answer session at the end. So to get started, I'm really happy to introduce Dr. Jan Chalupny. Uh, Doc Jan was a scientist uh, in the research end of the biotech industry, and she worked at Immunex, which is in Seattle, one of our favorite hometown companies. Until it got bought, but anyway, <laughs> um, it was it's still a favorite. Uh, she continued working there after the company was purchased by Amgen, and she has a long history of mentoring high school students and college students in the Puget Sound area. Shoreline Community College has been really lucky that Jan has such a passion for teaching that she has been teaching a research course at Shoreline, and she is a, a PI on this grant that Shoreline has with cell therapy and biomanufacturing. And with that, take it away, Jan. Thanks, Sandy. Um, I'm excited to be here to, to talk about the biomanufacturing kit. Uh, so I guess I need to share my screen, right? Can I share my screen? Okay, can everybody see my screen? Okay, so um, like Sandy said, I've been working on developing a biomanufacturing kit. And so um, it's, it's finally ready to be used in classrooms. Um, so that's pretty exciting. All right, so the, the kit, um, the development of the kit was funded by this grant from the NSF, uh, establishing a hub to support education of biomanufacturing technicians in cell therapy and immunotherapy. And Guy Hamilton is the PI and I'm the co-PI. All right, so anytime I develop curriculum, uh, which is something that I really love to do, um, I find it really important to, to find collaborators amongst the group of people that I'm developing the curriculum for. So in this case, high school um, biotech teachers. So I put together kind of a mini advisory committee of several high school biotech teachers who could advise me um, as I worked on developing this kit. Uh, so their names are listed here on the slide. They're all teachers that have quite a bit of experience teaching biotech um, to high school students. And the first thing I discovered when I asked them if they would um, advise me um, and be involved in the development of this kit, uh, the, the first thing they all asked is what is biomanufacturing? So even though they'd been teaching biotech for 10 plus years, most of them, um, they were not familiar with biomanufacturing. And I, I think that's pretty much the norm. Um, most people do not know what biomanufacturing is. So we had some meetings to discuss what biomanufacturing is, and then they came on board um, to advise me um, as I developed this kit. Um, and so we made the decision to try to, um, to, try to base this kit um, off of some other types of curriculum that high school teachers in our area and probably around the country already use. So this is something that builds off of things that the teachers are already familiar with and are already using, um, mainly the Amgen Biotech Experience Labs, which we support here um, in our kit loan program, which I manage. Um, so those labs deal with uh, recombinant DNA using uh, as a model red fluorescent protein. And the other similar labs that many teachers use are the BioRad PGLO labs, which are which also deal with recombinant DNA technology, uh, but using GFP instead of RFP. So those labs involve, you know, creating a plasmid that contains the gene um, of interest, either RFP or GFP, and then transforming bacteria um, to see if you get production of the protein, uh, which results in a colorimetric change that students can see, as well as 
fluorescence. Um, and then maybe growing up a small amount of the RFP or GFP positive bacteria and then doing some protein purification. So this kit just kind of expands those labs, the, um, the growing of the bacteria and the protein purification and adds some extra curriculum around biomanufacturing and how it's different from um, you know, biotech research in general. Uh, so the kit is broken down into three modules, which are showing up here. You know, down here is kind of the sequence of the Amgen Biotech Experience and BioRad Piglo Labs. Uh, the, these modules fit in uh, down here at this end of you know bacterial growth and protein purification. So module one deals with um, training and regulations, uh, some career exploration around biomanufacturing and how those. Um, how that type of work and those careers are both similar and different to, um, for instance, jobs um, in biotech research. And then we move into module two, which deals with upstream processing. So growing the bacteria that are producing your protein of interest. And then module three, um, which is basically downstream process, protein purification. Um, so expanding these, um, you know, larger scale uh, bacterial, uh, cultures and um, adding some QC in here, you know, as you would have QC in biomanufacturing, um, adding some QC labs so that students can um, get some kind of idea of the, their proficiency in these techniques and, and their success. Okay, so there were a number of challenges developing these kit, uh, this kit, as there always are developing kits for high school labs. Uh, one of the big ones is equipment, you know, what it, Biomanufacturing uses some very high tech, large, expensive equipment that you know teachers don't have. Number one, nor can, nor do I have the money to buy that, and it's also too big to loan out to teachers and have them transport into their classroom and and then bring back to me. So trying to figure out what teachers have and then what can I buy um, to allow teachers to scale up some bacterial growth and um, and do some QC. What type of equipment can I buy that's affordable enough to buy several um, several pieces of it to loan out to different teachers? You know, what's affordable? What's portable? What's not too large and heavy? Um, so you know, things like pipettes, centrifuges, shaker incubators, spectrophotometers. A lot of teachers don't have those in their classroom, so we needed to be able to um, purchase those things so that we could loan them out. Um, then there's the time constraint piece that class periods are, you know, 50 minutes, sometimes maybe 90 minutes, uh, but certainly, you know, regular biomanufacturing does not run within those time constraints. Cells grow and grow and grow, you know, on their own timeline. Um, and so you have to develop things that are doable within the class period length that teachers have to work with. Uh, as well as also not making the entire kit curriculum too long so that it takes up too much of a teacher's um, year or semester or whatever. Uh, we also wanted to keep it interesting and engaging, um, try to bring in videos and games and kind of a contest or challenge aspect, um, especially when you're trying to teach, you know, rules and regulations and things like that. It, uh, it's a challenge to find engaging ways to do that um, so that students don't get bored. Uh, we, don't all, we also don't wanna overwhelm the students with, for instance, tons of SOPs or tons of documentation. We wanna introduce those concepts because they're very important in biomanufacturing, but not overwhelm the students uh, with so much paperwork that you know, they tune out. <clears throat> okay, so the original um, kind of my original vision for how this would work would that be that students would work in teams of five um, and each student would have one of these jobs here um, process engineer qc technician qa technician upstream process technician or downstream process technician um, and each of those teams um, is their new hires at ppp protein production partners a contract research organization and they're being onboarded and trained and learning the processes involved in biomanufacturing, um, you know, to prove that they have what it takes, you know, to stay in employment at PPP. Um, 
And one of the one of the teacher advisors that I was working with, Diane Thompson, bravely decided to beta test some of the curriculum back in June with her students, which was really great um, and gave us a lot of good feedback, um, especially around this idea of teams and jobs. Um, one of the first things that um, that Diane shared with me is that her classroom is really set up for students to work in groups of four. And that's how she runs most labs in her classroom. And it's really difficult to switch to groups of five. So clearly um, that needs to be flexible so that teachers can do what works in their classroom. Um, so, you know, a teacher could certainly play the role of the QA technician because the QA technician mostly is signing off on a lot of the documentation. So. Students can work in teams of four or five. Um, I really am planning to limit it to no smaller than four because otherwise the cost of materials and reagents starts to climb a little too high. Um, and then the idea was that students would either choose one of these jobs or be assigned a job and they would play that role for the entire time on their team. And that soon proved to be challenging because students are absent for a variety of reasons on any given day. They might be sick, maybe they're on a sports team that has to leave school early to go play a game, whatever. So it became clear that it, was, it would be hard to have one student in the same role throughout the whole curriculum. And so that's something that also has to be more flexible. Um, so we've come up with some other possibilities for teachers to um, use, for instance, Students could have a primary job and also a secondary job so that if the person with the primary job is absent, the person with that, that job as a secondary job could play that as a backup role. Or maybe that students could choose or be assigned jobs daily so that one day they'd be the QC technician, the next day they might be the process, en uh, the pro the process engineer. Um, Basically, all the students in Diane's class wanted to do all the stuff. So um, the team aspect of it is challenging. I mean, I think it's important to, to um, introduce that to students because that's how uh, biomanufacturing works, right? People have a role and they play that role. They do that job. Um, but there needs to be flexibility around you know, student attendance um, and also keeping the students interested in letting them you know, explore things um, and kind of get into it. And so there's also this optional competition aspect um, that teachers can do or not do depending on whether they think this would be work well with their class or not, where the different stages of the process, the biomanufacturing process can be worth points and the QC tests that students do can influence, you know, how many points they get for those different um, stages of the process. And there could be awards, um, you know, like who gets the, the next um, contract to produce a, a protein at um, PPP. All right, so the, the kit curriculum in brief starts with an intro to biomanufacturing because of course these students don't know what it is either. Um, and so there's a, um, an exploration of a couple of different possible scenarios, run around insulin and one around the mRNA COVID vaccines where students share what they know, what they don't know and want to know. Then they do some reading, watch some videos, et cetera. Um, and they use a graphic organizer that was designed by one of the teacher um, advisors for the development of this kit um, to kind of center themselves in biomanufacturing and how um, insulin or mRNA vaccines you know, are products that are produced by biomanufacturing and to, to get them kind of into that mindset before they start the rest of the curriculum. Uh, so then briefly, module one is an onboarding um, type of module where the, the new hires get training, they learn about regulations, they do some career exploration. Um, that's something that's important for CTE funded um, um, courses in the, at the high school level, uh, which biomanufacturing classes often are CTE classes. So there's a welcome to PPP. Um, students are broken up into their teams. They choose a team name and they design a logo. Uh, then they have lab safety training. They have training around the FDA, uh, good manufacturing process, quality systems. Um, so there are some videos and games built in here. Um, then they get their job assignments or choose their job assignments and do some career exploration assignments, you know, 
learn about one of the job descriptions and then come back as a team or as a class to share you know what they've learned so that everybody gets to learn about a number of different careers in biomanufacturing. Uh, they are introduced to SOPs, standard operating procedures, how these are different from your regular laboratory protocols. Um, again, I use a video here um, around making a peanut butter sandwich and how important it is to spell out exactly how, how you want things done rather than just assuming that someone knows, you know, when you say spread the peanut butter on the bread, what does that mean? Where do you spread it? How do you spread it? Um, and then there's an assignment around um, writing their own SOP for micropipetting, um, sharing those uh, with each other, testing them out, uh, et cetera, giving feedback. Uh, so there is documentation for module one. There's a training record that all members of the team have to fill out um, once they've gone through all, all these different training um, lessons. Then module two, upstream process, cell culture and protein production. Uh, teams start by testing sterility of LB using an SOP after they've learned aseptic technique. And this is something that I'm having all students do so that they all get to practice their, um, their sterile technique. And, and this is, um, they, they take uh, sterile LB, remove some from the vial, spread it on um, an LB plate, and then grow that plate overnight and see if they get any colonies or not. Um, then they jump into, you know, inoculating LB with a, <clears throat> a colony that's either RFP positive or GFP positive, um, doing an overnight culture, then expanding their bacterial culture up to 50 mils, um, learning about bacterial growth curves, measuring bacterial growth using a spectrophotometer and, and using an SOP for spectrophotometer use. Um, so they learn how to graph a growth curve. This is a, a lab that's challenging um, as far as time constraints. Um, students don't have enough time to take enough time points um, to graph an entire growth curve of their own um, bacterial growth for the, for the class or for the kit curriculum. But I have included um, data points um, in a document that students can use to graph a growth curve. And, and within a given class period, they have time to take a couple of OD readings and then maybe one the next day. Um, but the, the class period time length does not lend itself to, you know, being able to graph their entire growth curve, but with provided data, they can still do that. Um, then they induce protein production um, by using arabinose. They have to calculate how much arabinose they need to use. So we're trying to build some, you know, applied mathematics in here. Um, there's information about, you know, why induce protein production? Why not just have constitutive protein production? How does arabinose induce protein production, et cetera? Um, you know, and with all of these different procedures that they do, there are PowerPoints available for the teachers to use, you know, to teach some of the concepts, et cetera. Uh, then they harvest their bacterial culture. And then as a uh, quality control uh, measure, they use limiting dilution in the spread plate method to, to measure their CFU per mil. Um, and then the documentation for this module is their aseptic techno technique results form and their upstream process, process batch record. So each team is doing these forms. Each team has a, um, some kind of receptacle, a notebook or something where they, where they keep their forms and they fill them out as they go along and you know, sign off at the end and the, the QA technician signs off on everything when the forms are finished. Then downstream process, they spin down their bacteria, they take a, an aliquot of bacteria and lyse it, um, and then they're purifying either RFP or GFP using column chromatography. Um, then as a QC um, you know, test, they, they're going to measure their protein um, yield, and they do this using the Bradford or otherwise known as the Kumasi assay to measure protein concentration. So again, they're, they're using the spectrophotometer again, um, and they've got albumin standards so they can generate a standard curve. So you can see this is an example of standard curve samples down here, um, measuring OD595. They have to heat denature the protein first because in its fluorescent form, the fluorescence interferes with the measurement at OD595. So they heat denature, and then they can measure um, 
the protein production of their own purified or the the yield of their own purified protein, you know, what their concentration is um, and what their total um, total protein yield is. So here they're, you know, they're graphing um, the equation of a line with their standard curve and then using that um, that equation to calculate their purified protein concentration and yield. So more applied mathematics and use of Excel or other types of graphing programs. Um, and then the documentation here is their downstream process batch record, which they fill in as they, you know, work through the downstream process. And um, then they also create a, a product brand name and label um, for their product where they have to include certain, um, certain information on that label. Okay, so that in sort of a really super quick nutshell is the curriculum. Um, we have, um, I've done one teacher training workshop in August, nine teachers attended. Um, the curriculum was really well received. I, I got a lot of good feedback about improvements and you know finding mistakes and typos and things like that. It was great to have nine sets of eyes on all the documents. Um, as you know, it's impossible to proofread your own documents. Uh, and we have, um, due to demand, I've scheduled another workshop uh, for December and have nine more teachers registered so far. So kit use in the classroom is really, you know, happening this academic year with the exception of the brave Diane Thompson who um, beta tested some of these labs back in June. Um, teachers who've taken the workshop will be checking out the kit and using it um, this current academic year. So I'm really um, looking forward to hearing more feedback about how this goes, you know, with large groups of students in the classroom. Uh, and due to teacher demand, I've worked on a number of curriculum extension um, units. Um, anything with a check here is something that I've completed. And then there are things I'm still working on. So um, some bacterial growth calcula calculations to um, include a few more um, mathematics type activities. Um, Lessons using the virtual upstream processing program um, that we've discussed uh, in various Innovate Bio meetings um, before, and that's really useful, as well as the virtual downstream processing program that's available. Uh, some lessons around bioreactors. You know, in this curriculum, students scale up to 50 mils in a baffled flask, and that's as far as it goes. Um, so we wanted to allow students to learn about, you know, what what larger bioreactors really look like um, and how they work. Um, I also developed a biomanufacturing trivial pursuit game that students could play you know, after they finished the curriculum. Um, and then um, I'm working on some immunotherapy lessons to sort of build off of um, this kit. I mean, for this kit, I felt like we really had to stick to bacteria because that's something that teachers have grown before often you know, have, have some knowledge about how to um, culture and often some equipment for you know, culturing it versus breaking out into some brand new type of cell um, that they haven't used before like yeast or insect cells or something that would be doable in a high school classroom. Um, so I've just, we just stuck to bacteria here, but we definitely want teachers to know more especially about the immunotherapy methods that are being developed, you know, CAR T cells and things like that. Uh, so I'm working on some curriculum to include for that. Um, and then all the curriculum is publicly available on this public Canvas um, page that we have. So the link for the biomanufacturing kit curriculum is shown at the bottom of this slide. Um, oh, and I should have included my email address. I'll put it in the chat. And then anyone who has you know, a more complicated question to ask me, please feel free to email me. I don't know how much time we really have for questions um, you know, uh, during this. They'll, they'll all be at the end. And we need to wrap up this part soon. Yep, that, that, this is it. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, Jan. This is really exciting. And I think it'll be really useful. I'm looking forward to learning more about the Trivial Pursuit game. So I'll, I'll get in touch with you about that because I'd like to see it too. And now we have a rare opportunity to uh, go live to Jim Hewlett's laboratory and learn more about um, about growing mushrooms. And I think uh, you need to click the unshare. Do I unshare? Okay, stop share. There we yeah, go. Yeah, stop share. There we go. Got it. All right, Jim.
take it away. And I should say Jim Hewlett is famous for um, his, his efforts to promote undergraduate research in community college labs, which is really a wonderful thing. And he's also a co-PI on Innovate Bio. You guys can see the screen okay? Yes. Okay, so the live version is a window that says FLCC lab. So that's gonna be running concurrently while I'm going through the, the actual theory behind this. Um, so if you look on the gallery mode, or if you wanna blow that one up, you'll see the students and also the lab that, we, that we're doing this work in. So this is, um, this is a project we started, I think now almost, almost a year and a half, maybe two years ago. And so it's, it's actually a, it's a, it's a fermentation platform using mushroom mycelium. And I'll get into a little bit about why we're doing it and, and, and a little bit more about how we're doing it in, as we get, as we get through this. So the, the, just as a basic introduction, this isn't something new that we we know that mushrooms have all these bioactive compounds that have all these medicinal properties. So um, what we're doing here is not, not groundbreaking in terms of trying to, produce something that we can show has health benefits because that's pretty much been done. This is really focused on optimizing a process for producing these bioactive compounds in very high concentrations that can be commercialized. And so some of these are these like these beta glucans that you see up here. Um, I'm going to hold this up. Uh, this, you know, that ends up in these mushrooms that end up in these products like this. Um, but the difference is in this product, what they do is they grow the mushrooms on brown rice and right before the mushroom fruits, they grind up the rice and the mycelium and put it into a, um, a capsule and then, and then bottle it. So what you end up with is you end up with all the great stuff that you want to have those bioactive compounds, but you also get the brown rice and uh, the biomass and the mycelium and things like that. So the difference here is that what we're trying to do is to optimize the production of just these compounds from, from mushroom mycelium in a submerged fermentation system. So that what you end up with in the end is not brown rice and biomass, but actually concentrated bioactive exopolysaccharides, right? That can be then commercialized. Um, so just a quick biology lesson for those that don't know about mushrooms, right? The part that we're focused on is the, is the part down here, the mycelium. So when you see the mushrooms popping up in your yard, right? That's the fruiting body of the, of the organism. We're actually, what we're working with is the, um, is the mycelium, which is often something that you can see. And the two species that we're working with are two Ganoderma species, Lucinum and Sugi, uh, just because um, they are two species that our industry partner uh, are very interested in. So as a disclaimer, um, this is a collaboration with a company called Leap Foods, which makes culinary mushrooms, but they want to expand their business into areas like nutraceuticals, animal feed, um, and all sorts of other aspects. So that's, that's why they're interested in um, in this technology. So uh, all, all of the IP is sort of co-owned by us and, and Leap Foods. So, so the upstream process is pretty straightforward. So you can see up here uh, in this picture at the top left is, um, is the mycelium growing on just simple PDA plates, right? So that's the initial, that's gonna be our initial seed culture. And then that is used to inoculate shake flasks. Here's a shake flask over here. You can see the, those little white spots. That's the mycelium. Um, so these are baffled shake flasks, which are then put into an incubator and they're just shaken. So I would say that for, for those that don't have large bioreactors, you could do this work uh, at this scale and still do everything that we're doing, right? We, all we've done is gone from these 250 milliliter shake flasks up to larger bioreactors. But if this is something that you think you might want to do in your programs, um, you could do it at the scale and, and not have to go up to the larger bioreactors. And then for, for purity, because our, our biggest problem is contamination, because the stuff that we're feeding the mycelium, it likes to get eaten by just about every other contaminant and pathogen on the planet. And so it, it has been a challenge to try to keep things clean. Um, so we have, a, um, we have a, a color metric test to look for contamination, but we also do these prepared slides. And here you can actually see the mycelium um, uh, under the microscope here. So everything we try to do is like, so we, cleanliness, um, aseptic technique is critical in this project to be able to keep things, keep things clean. All right, so, so in continuing to scale up, once these shake flasks have gotten to a certain maturity, we then can inoculate our larger 
bioreactors, right? So we have, we have a two liter and a five liter bioreactor committed to this project. And we have two different media formulations. We have a glucose-based media formulation and a lactose-based uh, media formulation. And we're, we're, testing, we're testing both under a variety of different growing conditions. And um, this picture here, you can kind of see the, the morphology, right, of, of how, this, how the mycelium grow. They grow in these, uh, these tiny little pellets. Um, so we like to walk in after a few days and see the, lots of these little things and very clear media. Uh, when you walk in and you see a very cloudy media, we automatically know it's probably contaminated, right? And so, those, so once we get to this scale, these batches that we're, that we're running will go um, usually, usually they go from anywhere from 10, 10 to 14 days, but I'm going to show you some data later that suggests that we might not even need to go that far, at least with the, the method that we're using right now or the protocols that we're using. All right. So, so that runs for, like I said, 10 days to, to two weeks. And then we start the, um, the downstream part of, of this process. So we, we have, we have two product streams in this, in this project. We have the actual mycelium itself, right? We get large amounts of biomass, which currently we, all we do is dry it and turn it into a powder and give it to Leap Foods. Um, we're not doing anything in terms of the research on that product stream yet. Yeah, I should say yet. Uh, what we're focused on is what's in the media, right? These, these biomacromolecules, these exopolysaccharides. And so to get at those, we, we centrifuge um, to get the biomass out. And then we use an ultra filtration system, which you can kind of see shadowed in the background here to, uh, to concentrate these, these molecules down. And then as sort of a last step, we can ethanol precipitate out um, those molecules and then, and then dry that into a powder. Now, we are, not we are not yet characterizing what molecules are actually in that powder. Uh, we're making an assumption because we're measuring large amounts of sugars that we're, we are getting these exopolysaccharides. But very likely, there's a lot of different proteins. Certainly, there's enzymes in there that, that the uh, mycelium is excreting because they would do that normally in nature as they're growing underground, right? That's how they get through um, the substrate that they would naturally grow on. So, so that part we haven't really um, been able to focus on yet. Uh, the analytical methods that we do, biomass is very simple. You just dry weight, right, to see how much biomass we have. Uh, for the smaller reducing sugars, we do a DNA, DNS assay. Um, again. A colorimetric assay, and then for for total polysaccharide, it's a phenol sulfuric method, which we're trying to figure out a way to get around that because we don't like the phenol in the lab. It's not a good thing to work with, so we've been toying around with another assay to look for total polysaccharides. So what'll happen is as the batch is running, we're drawing samples out regularly, and then and then running ass running the assays for the sugars to see what um, what level of sugars that we have, and then the and, and biomass is similar, but you'll see in a minute. We have an issue with doing that on a on a, a time scale, um, and so just some quick results. I'm not going to go through the graphs here. I'm just going to point out some patterns here. So this is for lucidum. This is the Ganoderma species, one of the Ganoderma species, uh, with both to total polysaccharides and biomass. So biomass is in orange, and then the total polysaccharides are in, are in blue. And um, you can see the problem here. I I assume I would ask this question. Where's all, what's, what's happening to your biomass, right? You get to like day seven and wait a minute, what is, is the mushroom disappearing? And the problem is we get, there's so much biomass, it starts to cake against the walls and the sparger and everything else that as we're drawing media out of the bioreactor, the biomass is going down because it's leaving the media and, and caking the walls and everything else that's inside there. So it makes it look like we're losing biomass. Um, we could lose total polysaccharide because we don't feed the batch and so what happens is if, if it runs out of glucose or lactose, it'll switch over to the sugars that it's actually excreting into the media. And then you can see a drop, right? So the point of these graphs, though, is to show that what we were thinking about is that right around day nine or 10 is really where we're optimizing um, our process, again, without giving the batch another feed. So we feed it in the beginning, let it run all the way to the end. We're not feeding more along the way in, the, in, these, in these batches here. And then as a, as a summary, just so you can see kind of what our results are, uh, is that we're finding that lucidum as a species in a glucose-based media gives us the highest biomass. So if we wanted to make dry mycelium, though lucidum and glucose seems to be our way to go. But that biomass does not translate into more sugars, 
right? Here's that yellow line down here for total polysaccharides for that species. Where if you look at the blue line for SUGI, the total polysaccharide concentrations are as much as a, a gram per liter. So for leap foods, if they're trying to optimize the production of these large sugars, um, SUGI in a, a lactose-based media we're finding currently is sort of our optimized um, process for that. And um, the, the work continues because now we're starting to mess around with certain parameters like temperature, pH, um, mixing. Uh, we're, we're modifying the, the media formulation. We're doing fed batch um, to be able to see if we can actually keep those, the batches going. So there's a lot more work to be done, but, um, but at least we've gotten to this point now where we can share these results. And then just as a thank you, obviously, you know, I'm, I am a co-PI on Innovate Bio, but I was also co-PI for years uh, on NBC2, which is the Northeast Biomanufacturing Center and Collaborative, um, which, is, uh, which has been around for a long time and uh, has just ended, which, which is sad because it, it was a great, great project. And, then, and I should say that a lot of the funding for this came from a supplement that was written off of that grant. And then our, our obviously our industry partner, Leap Foods, um, my college, our wonderful students, right? Here's Demi, she's in the lab here working on uh, one of our batches. And then again, if you look at the window that says FLCC lab, you'll see the space that we're actually doing this in, uh, along with uh, Jessica Halliday, who's our project lead and, and some of our amazing students. And they're, they're in there hopefully learning something right now from this presentation. So hopefully I got us back on track in terms of the time here and um, I'll take some questions at the end, but thank you very much. That's great, Jim. It's really fun to hear, you know, you've come a long way and it's really fun to hear what the students have been doing and about the project. It sounds great. Thank you. Okay, Bruce, um, Bruce, Dr. Bruce Nash from the DNA Learning Center at Cold Spring Harbor is gonna talk about a grant that just got funded. So he doesn't have, I don't think he has results just yet, but he's gonna talk about the premise behind the grant and some of the work that they're going to do. And this is all about manufacturing phage in vitro, so no cells. <laughs> Take it away, Bruce. All right, uh, can you see my presentation now? Per can you hear me and see that? Okay. So, yes, yes. So, uh, so the, this grant is with uh, partners at the University of Minnesota, uh, where they've developed a technology to do transcription and translation in vitro uh, for E. coli systems. So it's called TXTL for transcription and translation. And they've been able to show that you can make bacteriophage in vitro, no cells, just with the DNA. Okay, so their goal is to uh, take this to large scale by manufacturing levels and also broaden the range of hosts uh, for phage that are important for medicine and for other uh, sort of agricultural and veterinary type applications. Uh, and, you know, phage are everywhere. They're hugely diverse uh, and kind of cool. And, and they're a great, you know, uh, uh, way to deal with some big problems that we have. But in any case, you know, sort of the educational goal at the Learning Center is to take this science and turn it into curriculum that teaches some basic molecular biology, uh, eventually some bioinformatics, and then biotech training of various sorts. And uh, I think it's a really nice model, but of course we're really at the very start of this. And this grant is a future manufacturing grant. So it's cutting edge, cutting edge science. They're developing this biomanufacturing in these different applications now. And we're going to do the educational programs, you know, building off of what they develop over the next few years. Okay. Uh, but this, the system itself is already in place, uh, at least for E. coli and a few other systems. Uh, but we're going to work with E. coli because that's what you can use in teaching with little problem, uh, because many schools have E. coli, know how to grow it, know about it, and it's safe. Uh, and for some of the assays, you need the host to work with it. Okay, so essentially in the tube, you have this extract with all the components you need for transcription and translation. Uh, and then it supports transcription or translation from uh, E. coli promoters and T7 and other viral uh, 
E. coli viral systems. Okay, uh, their sort of proof of concept experiment uh, might sound familiar. It's making GFP, uh, and uh, in about six hours you get tons of GFP. So I imagine in classes this might be something that's done overnight, uh, or in a class where you have uh, people around for a day. Okay, and you can make quite a lot, and then of course. Uh, from this, you can do all the same sort of things with the GFP to look at quality and quantity as Jan was talking about. So we envisage uh, building a whole curriculum around just this GFP thing. But the one that I think is much more cool is when you take the genome from a phage and let it sit for uh, a few hours and you get infectious phage out of it. So the system will transcribe and translate Everything that's needed, you get DNA replication, and then the phage self-assemble just with what's in the tube. And then, of course, these are an active agent, and it's a valuable commodity. So we think this is a great model for a biomanufacturing uh, exercise for biotech or biomanufacturing programs with a cool product that's really relevant. Okay, so. Uh, you can take this and then you can, of course, infect some bacteria. So this is just an example of a graph of the effect of the phage on uh, uh, liquid culture and just measure, measuring it in this case with a plate reader. I imagine in uh, a high school or biotech lab that doesn't have a plate reader that will have to come up with other ways to measure it, including maybe those cool flasks that Linnea was talking about in the chat, where you can measure the optical density in real time with sensors, okay? Uh, but in any case, you can, you can do these assays. You can also do spot tests and serial dilutions. These are all important skills. They require really careful work and aseptic technique. They're all really important things that uh, a student would need to learn and it would be valued by uh, a company, okay? So just some advantages of these phage, in case you were wondering why would you do this when you can just infect bacteria? Well, E. coli, fine, we can grow bacteria and we can make lots of phage. And that's pretty straightforward and not very dangerous, except when it's pathogenic E. coli uh, or other pathogens. So right now to make phage for therapies, you have to grow the pathogen. So you need to have a very secure lab. You have to have people who are very well trained. It's very expensive and dangerous. And you also have the potential of actually making phage res resistant pathogens in your lab. So you have to be careful to monitor that, to limit the possibility that that escapes because the whole goal is to come up with something that can replace uh, anti you know, other antimicrobial agents like antibiotics. Uh, it's fast, it's scalable, at least in theory. Uh, they're working on that now. You get very high yield, so you can get uh, enough of this phage from even, even these small, uh, you know, tens of milliliter uh, cultures to do therapies. And it's also uh, a platform where you can do genetic engineering and then make the phage immediately. So you can do CRISPR in vitro, and then you can have that DNA uh, be the platform for this, this process. And that lets people engineer quickly and safely and see what happens. Okay. Has lots of different applications. I don't think I need to go into this in any detail, but uh, you know, there's nearly infinite phage that could be uh, therapeutic. Uh, they're being used a lot in agriculture to control pests in agriculture and uh, both for plants and for animals now. They're actually, phage are used on food products to fight off pathogens. Uh, and then I mentioned vets earlier uh, and uh, their use in treating water especially wastewater is uh, also an important application. Yeah. Uh, all right, and so the educational goals, like I said, 
or to develop this GFP expression and make it uh, accessible to others, uh, then developed uh, as a starting point, probably phage T7 and one of the, uh, at least one other phage for E. coli infection. We anticipate that we're gonna be able to do some of this uh, CRISPR engineering in vitro, first for exercises and then maybe for authentic research. And we're also planning to have nanopore sequencing uh, built around this. So we'll have all the bioinformatics that goes with nanopore sequencing. Phage are perfect for that because the long reads from nanopore can read all the way through a whole genome. And we'll be able to look at the phage sequence in real time with students on these little nanopores, Oxford nanopore sort of thumb, thumb drive sized uh, sequencers. Uh, and we think that'll be really cool and also a, a good way to train people in some important skills. And then we'll develop a supply chain so people can produce, test, and supply this phage to others who wanna just do uh, some phage assays and teach people about phage and bacteria or make the, the phage DNA and the phage as a way to replicate this for others. And of course, teach biotech skills with this phage production. Okay. And then uh, we envisage that this could be turned into cures uh, as well as these biomanufacturing or biotech skill development things. Okay. And uh, I'm sure you can think about it more yourself, but there are many, many different skills that go in here and fit lots of different jobs in biotech. Uh, I went through lists for several of these and it has core skills for all of them. Uh, or you can build them in around this. So our goal eventually will be to get to that point. But for now, uh, we just have to get it working and then try to make it as accessible as we can for as many people as possible and see how it goes and then get feedback and, and make it into something hopefully really great. Okay. Uh, and you know, there are some skills for bioinformatics too for the nanopore stuff. Okay. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Stop my share. Hopefully there are a few minutes left uh, so we can discuss things. We do. Thanks, Bruce. That sounds really exciting. Um, the talk I went to Wednesday, one of the one of the uh, um, women who had one of the companies, she works on phage to treat cholera. And I could see where it'd be much nicer to be able to make those phage <laughs> in vitro without having to grow big real cholera and risk any kind of um, exactly. accidental. So happening. that's their big goal is to, you know, have have phage produced in large batches as therapeutics and without. Yeah, yeah, especially you know, choice. especially the the yeah, the antibiotic resistant <laughs> bacteria for sure. Um, Linnea had a question about the cost. How the cost of making phage in vitro might compare to the cost of making phage in bacteria? Uh, so for the pathogens, it's thousands of times cheaper, mm -hmm. apparently. For E. coli, I, I haven't done the math. I don't really know, but uh, uh, it might be more of a wash, but uh, it won't be very expensive to do these assays on a small scale, at least. It's good to know. Um, uh, and there's a, a comment uh, from somebody whose uh, child has cystic fibrosis. So they're really interested in phage therapy, excited about the project. So that's neat. So uh, more questions, guys. We've got some wonderful examples of curriculum here. We, okay, here's a question for Jim. Um, what is the time frame for your product to make it to market with Leap, Leap Foods and will the college be sharing in profits from sales? Can you guys hear me all right? Because I moved to the lab. Yeah. All right, great. Um, yeah, that's like that's a great question. The they are currently Leap Foods. Look, there's an ag tech park down the road near Cornell uh, that they're, they've moved into. They've got some space, that, so they're looking for the next level of scale up, which would be probably 50 liters, maybe. Um, but 
that their timeline is is not really clear in terms of when how they can commercialize this because the problem is they have to the, the market for this stuff is very strange because there's one big market for that goes into animal feed um because they the which is probably the biggest market because what it does is these these exopolysaccharides actually are immune, immune system boosters so you can actually reduce the amount of um, antibiotics that you use in livestock by using this as animal feed. Um, so that one probably would come faster. Uh, they're looking maybe like eight to 10 years down the road. But in terms of the nutraceutical side, that's probably a little bit longer. But but no, the college, the college does not have any plan in place for how they would share in the profits. If it looks like it's going to get commercialized, I will quit my job, start a, an LLC, and I'll carry my IP with me and then we'll I'll, I'll, I'll reap the profits maybe. I don't know. I, hopefully nobody heard that here, but that's a good question. <laughs> no, we didn't hear anything. <laughs> um, but we have, but there is another question for you. And this, I think this is an interesting one and it, it concerns the um, regulations. And uh, the question is, you don't have to go through the FDA for any kind of um, regulatory approval for this? No, because, well, no, because it falls, it's more, it's more, um, because it's on the nutraceutical side of things, then we sort of bypass the whole FDA type of approval process. Uh, I don't, again, we're, we're just doing everything here at small scale. We're, we're trying to just optimize the conditions. We don't have any plans for doing any testing in animals or humans. Uh, that's something that the companies will have to do later on. So um, they can deal with that regulatory piece uh, at the end. I, I'm just, uh, for me, again, personally, this is an educational thing for me. It, it gives students an incredible sort of industry relevant uh, opportunity to, to do research in the lab. Um, but yeah, we don't have any of that. We're, we, we do have them follow GLP in our space here so that they are actually the documentation is following that and our protocols are all, you know, GLP aligned. So, um, but yeah, other than that, that's that's about as far as it goes. Thanks. Okay, there's a question for Jan. Um, this is from Linnea about the possibility of, um, oh, <laughs> of course, it's a second AT, another ATE project. A, a second ATE project to broaden your um, the use and testing of your kit and uh, package it with an entry level certificate in biomanufacturing for dual credit high schools. Have you thought about that? Um, yes and no. Um that that would be really exciting. I mean, definitely we want to use this kit as kind of an on ramp for high school local high school students who might want to come to shoreline and be part of um, our various offerings for training in biomanufacturing. So, you know, expanding it further um, and testing it with more schools um, would be great. Uh, you know, we yeah, we need some buy in from the administration here as far as you know, administering another grant and having we need some more um, some more people uh, to work on it uh, for sure. But it, that would be great. There's uh, another question for you too, Jan, which is about the um, a list of equipment that is found in the kit, and do you customize this depending on what teachers already have? Yeah, absolutely. Our whole kit, um, our whole kit program, any of our kits, it's all customized. Um, as far as what teachers need. So the, um, the request form has a list of equipment and teachers check off what they need. So I just pack what they need. Um, if they need everything, they get everything. If they just need some things, you know, I, I pack the pieces of equipment that they need. Um, I, I have not generated, well, there's a list of equipment on our request form. Um, so if folks wanna see what that is, um, if they go to the Canvas site, and click on the um, link that's in the request a kit portion, then they'll get to the page where the request form is. And then when you open that request form and click on biomanufacturing, then you can click on the list of equipment. You know, it's, it's basically, uh, do they need a bacterial plate incubator? Do they need a shaker incubator, spectrophotometer, heat block, mini centrifuges, micropipetters? Um, that's the basic um, equipment. Uh, right. And I'll put a link to this. Um, I'll make sure we have a link to that page when I post the video as well. Um, we have uh, two more questions, I think. One is for Jim, which is uh, from Uwe. Um, how do you envision using your system once you've optimized the current setup? So like students two or three down the 
two or three years down the road, what do you see? If I if I may quickly clarify, okay. I, I think that's a little combobulated question. I wonder um, uh, how you can use your system as a platform to basically um, adopt different uh, fungi, say, or uh, different uh, products that you're going after to, to utilize it continuously and not to have that one way road from uh, starting it in education, going into production, becoming a millionaire, and then it's all done. <laughs> yeah, well, as I said, my focus is really on, on, the, on the education part of this. So I think in the future, it's because right now we're really focused on two species and two media formulations. Well, that's even the iterations there, when you add in all the other variables, this could go on forever, right? In terms of pH and temperature, and I mean, all sorts of other salts and things that we could do. So, but once we get a system that we feel like we can, uh, a protocol where we can, we can optimize things really quickly, we would probably switch to different species. We would also switch to different media formulations because what we're trying to do, I should say that like, for example, the lactose is because we have a huge dairy industry here in New York and the state's interested, there's a massive waste stream that's very lactose rich. And so they're interested in, can we use that lactose rich waste stream for other applications? And so that's why we're using that. So we would then start for, to look at waste streams from other industries like the apple industry, making cider and things like that. And can we grab those waste streams and then actually optimize the production of these, of these sugars with other species using these other waste streams? So that, I mean, this, this could be a career, right? This could go Ooh. on forever. You could, the oh, circular you economy, right, Jim? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, then you get you get funding, right? Because the state wants to figure out a way to handle all these waste streams, and if they'll pour money into the project if, if we can show that there's an application that can use it. And we have to keep. I don't your mind that I jumped in, Sandy, and mentioned to Bruce <laughs> the idea of something that a drug that evolves faster than the pathogenic bacteria is the future. A good thing for sure. So what I'd say is that uh, a nearly infinite source of drugs that have already evolved to attack these pathogens is at least the initial goal. So uh, there are many, many, many phage to most bacteria. So they're, they're already out there. And then uh, much like in HIV treatment, you know, having a multi-drug multi treatment makes resistance much less likely. So one of the goals is to have multiple different phages that attack the same pathogenic strain uh, so that uh, evolution of resistance will be much less likely. Uh, but yeah, uh, under, under some occasions, uh, being able to modify the phage is going to be important. So uh, one area they're ex exploring is uh, basically switching out the, the attachment points on phage so that phage that evolved with totally different hosts can infect pathogens that have never seen them. So they haven't had a chance to evolve any resistance to that specific phage. And that has been shown to work in some cases. If that works in a sort of general way, then the phage, the phage are going to have a huge uh, sort of leg up uh, because their their little legs, their their attachment points are going to be uh, able to target the, the bacteria, and then the poor bacteria are going to be attacked with biology they haven't seen before. Uh, that's one of their hopes. Well, that sounds very exciting. Well, I want to, um, before everybody's gone, give a hand to all of our presenters. All right. Thank you, all of you. This has been great. We will be posting the recording on the website. You'll see it uh, probably by Monday afternoon. And we will also be mentioning it with links in the newsletter. And for sure, I'll put a link to the Shoreline curriculum on that page as well. So everybody can find it. And yes, we're sharing the recording. It will be in our YouTube channel. Thanks for coming, everyone. Yeah, thanks. It was great to see you all. And next week, we're going to have a talk about math and strategies for teaching biotech math. So I hope to see you there. We'll have uh, the famous Dr. Lisa Seidman, who's, as you know, ha has textbooks that a lot of people use on biotech and biotech math. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank